And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker. This is Pastor Mike. The only way you can tell it like it is is if you got a can. You need a good fresh can of King James Bible. Grab one at the nearest download center today. King James Pure Bible Search software is, uh, we are nearing the launch of version 2.0. There are some beta testers out there right now sort of looking at it. And uh, so we'll give you an announcement on that as we get it along. Good to be with you today. And uh, I've got a bunch of news stories today, but I think, I don't know, I'm just, I'm going to do something. I think I'm going to stick with the Bible today. Uh, that's just kind of how I, I feel led. I've got um, some things to talk about. I tweeted earlier this idea of love not the world. It's a sort of a sermon I preached several years ago. I preached it uh, at a youth camp. I've done this a couple of times at youth camps, and it is a good message. So uh, any parents out there, if you've got kids homeschooling or whatever, gather them around today uh, because I'm going to kind of target this toward the young people, but it is always applicable to us older folks as well because after all, We've got a lot more years worth of world in us than our young people do. What we want to do is try to get our, our youth, our children, our grandchildren to avoid the world. And the reason why is that we've made the mistake of being part of the world and actually loving parts of this world. And it takes, it seems like to me, it takes more effort to get us at, to get the world out of us than it does to keep people from the world at a young age. It, I hope that made sense. And we're going to be dealing with that here in just a little bit. Um, I have not recorded a watchman for this week. I have not recorded a pure Bible study uh, for this week and for various reasons, but I am going to, um, I'm just going to hold off on that. I kind of lightened my load just a little bit this week, uh, and it's just something that I needed to do. But anyway, I'm going to give you a little bit more Bible today than, than what is normal uh, for Pastor Mike online. And I was just opening up, and I want you to look in uh, Matthew chapter 25, because that's where I'm going to be today. Uh, and then we're going to go to a couple different places but uh, several things on my mind. But you open, oh, just go ahead and open up your fresh can of King James. When you open up, you'll get the aroma of milk and honey coming out of that can. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, I, of course, will be using the authorized 1611 King James Bible. I am still to this day, uh, I don't know if I, maybe I should come up with a countdown clock or a count up clock or something like that. To this day, I'm still not ashamed of this Bible. I'm not ashamed to tell people, I use the King James. That's what, what, what other translations do you like? None. I, I don't like any of them. They're, they're really, they stink. They're really bad. They got, they got a bunch of stuff missing in it. They've got Jesus falling from heaven. They've got some dude who is the son of the gods in the fiery furnace with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't, I don't read other translations. I stick with the King James Bible. I like it. I think it's the Word of God. I think it's right. I think it's inerrant. I think it is, I think it is incorruptible. And uh, I think it's awesome, is what I think. So I'll be reading out of the King James today, Matthew chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Who are these? Church people. Um ready to meet the bridegroom, or going out to meet the bridegroom. That's the hope of everybody sitting in a church right now. Is, oh, I hope I go to heaven. Hope I make it to heaven. Hope I'm good enough. Believe it or not, there are some people who sit in churches who still are got this idea. Well, uh, you know, I just hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. Well, of course you're not. You're not good enough. You stink. You're full of sin and misery and corruption. That's why you need a Savior. And uh, verse 2, and five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. If you just take those two, those two themes, those two ideas, if you'll just take them and, and download the software, study wise things, wisdom, where it comes from, how to get it, 
Study foolish things. Study people that are fools. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Study, study what makes people foolish, ignorant things. Study that for yourself in the Bible. Um, study it for your own benefit and your own good. I've been preaching uh, last couple Wednesday nights, uh, going back into Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, I've been teaching a lot on personal responsibility, your personal responsibility to maintain your faith, to maintain your faithfulness, to uh, be consciously aware of your own actions, your own attitudes, your own uh, position in Christ, rather than rather than judging everybody else's, which there is a lot of that that goes on, especially in chat rooms and on Facebook and in every, especially the chat rooms. A lot of, I'm a better Christian than you are. I do this, and I believe this, and I say this, and I do this, and what? You don't do this? Well, how come you don't do this? There is a lot of that going on. And I don't, I don't know, but what, when Christ gives us a sword, I don't know that it's really necessary to use it on everybody else first. I think you ought to use it on yourself. I think you must, I think the word should apply to you primarily. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says. But we are all too apt to use the word of God as a weapon against other people to tell them, well, you're not saved. You're not saved. You're not like us. You're not saved. I struggle with that. That's something that's in me. That's something I want to do, but I have to be careful to judge someone's salvation. I am responsible for my own condition between me and God. Yes, I said that. I am responsible for that. God offered me a contract called the New Testament, and I accepted the terms of that contract. The contract that God gave to me under the terms of the New Covenant is believe the Word of God. Believe my son. Believe what he said. Believe every word that he said. That's the terms. And don't stop believing. There's that, there was a song in my mind. Don't stop believing. That's the terms of the contract. I am fully aware what the contract says to those who don't abide by the terms, just like the old contract at Mount Sinai. The old contract was not, didn't have anything to do with belief, didn't, didn't have faith in it. It was not mingled with faith. It was do, 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 perform, do all the works of the law, do this, do that, and don't fail one time. They said, we'll accept that. We'll do it. All that thou says, see, there was an offer by God and there was an acceptance by God's people. That's a contract. That's legal. It's legally binding. This is why God said there's now a breach here in the covenant. There was a breach of contract, not on God's part, on Israel's, because they broke the contract numerous times. They went whoring after other gods, specifically what God told them not to do. So there was the old contract. There was an offer by God and an acceptance and a benefit and a liability under that contract, the same as there is in the New Covenant. You can go through the whole of the New Testament and look from Matthew to Revelation, and you'll see that it's written just like a legal document, an offer by God of eternal life, an offer to pay a debt to you, for you on, on your behalf. That's the benefit that God offers us in this contract, in this covenant. He offers to pay our debts for us and cancel it out and clear the slate. So there's the offer, there's the benefit, and the terms and the conditions of the contract is you 
Number one, you don't call God a liar. You don't add to the word. You don't add to the contract. That's always a clause in just about every contract. Every good contract has a clause in it that says you don't add to the contract and you don't take away from the contract. This contract has 35 pages in it, and each page is initialed by both parties so that there is a, there's a record here and an acceptance that this is the whole of the contract. That's what we have is with the new covenant. We have Matthew to Revelation. It is not to be split up and splintered up like some people say. Well, that part of the contract, that well, that, you know, that really is, that's not for us. And the, it's the whole of the contract, new covenant, the new testament. The whole of it applies. And it's not contradictory the way some people say. But I've been, and and you when you accept the terms of that contract. You accept the benefit of the contract. There is a requirement on your part. There is in any covenant, in any testament, there is a requirement. And the requirement is, will you believe what I said? And will you hold fast that belief? So we have five wise and five foolish. Five of them held fast. So it says they were foolish. They that were foolish... Verse 3, took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. You see what they did? They were wise. They were prepared. They took it seriously. Go read about slothful people, lazy people, the vineyard of the slothful. Go read that. That's foolishness. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. You know what that is? And I, I, I could talk on this for the next three Pastor Mike Onlines. That's socialism. That is Obamacare. That is government handouts to people who could do for themselves. The government just makes it easier for them to not do for themselves. I, I'm not against certain government programs that help people that cannot help themselves. Nursing homes, those who have, uh, those who have physical disabilities or mental disabilities. We have guys that come to our church uh, Sunday morning and Wednesday night with mental disabilities. They're brought in from a group home. I am all for government money being used to take care of those people. I, and I love them. And they know me. They love me. We have a real good, we've always had a real good relationship with them. Give them, give them everything that they want or need is what I say. But when it comes to people who can work and won't, when it comes to people who, uh, who, who come in here illegally, if you do it by the law, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with you getting a little help to get started. But this here is a socialist idea. They, um, verse eight, the foolish said unto the wise, "Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out." Verse nine, but the wise answered, saying, "Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for your." selves. There is a, um, there's a concept out there and you probably, you don't, you, I'm not sure that you recognize it yet, but you've seen what it looks like, at least on the outside. It's called communitarianism. Barack Obama is a communitarianist. Communitarianism is a, is like a full-blooded brother of communism. Communitarianism basically says no one can benefit unless everybody benefits. We're, we all have to be together here or no one can get anything. And uh, in the church, there was, um, I don't know, I can't remember who it was, some liberal woman, Presbyterian bishop or whatever, who was a communitarianist. And she was ripping apart this idea of a personal salvation. Her idea was that if we can't save everybody, then nobody can be saved. That was her idea. That's what 
what is behind most churches who refer to themselves as community churches. Now, I have a good friend, John Uter, who has a, who has a little church in a storefront out in Oakland, Missouri. It's sort of a little country town, and they're used to the word community because that's really what they live in. They don't live in the city. They live in the community. So he has the Oakland Community Church, and I promise you, he is not emergent or anything like that. But some of the bigger churches, some of the hotshot churches that want to be noticed, they have this idea of community. You hear them talk about, oh, this is a great, this would be a great opportunity for community. Maybe even the, the, they themselves don't know the full extent of it, but what that really means is we can't really be satisfied in and of ourselves unless everybody is happy. And that's unbiblical. The five wise virgins, they were not being selfish. They were wise. They said, we prepared, we were ready. We had oil ready. We read our Bibles when we should have. We, we strove. We walked the narrow way. We lived the life. We took our Christianity and our relationship with our Lord seriously. It wasn't a boast. That's just saying, this is what we did. And you didn't. And now you're wanting us to give to you who did nothing. And you want us to pay for it. And if we do, there won't be enough for us. We can't do that. Go get your own oil. Buy it for yourself. That's what they did. That's what they told them. So you know the rest of the story. When the, when the, when the call come out, the bridegroom cometh, those that were wise, they went and they met. By the way, there was five. Go study First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. You'll see five things there that accompany the translation. Uh, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. You'll see a recurring theme of the number five associated with the translation. Abigail and her five maids that accompanied her as she married the shepherd king, David, king of the Jews. So th there's, a, there's a perfect, perfect analogy here. Um, in as it relates to the translation, and I believe this is a picture of the translation, and I I absolutely believe there are going to be some people sitting in church pews who aren't going. They're not going. Why? They didn't take their responsibility seriously. They were some of these social. Christians going to such and such church because that's what that's what our that's what our parents did and that's what we're going to do and this is this is this is this is our church this is what we like we go to that church but as far as their relationship with their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ they don't take it seriously I'm not judging any one person I just know that on a whole that's who's out there that's what they're doing um, I had this in my mind earlier today. In fact, when I woke up, that was in my mind. In Romans chapter 14, um, there's a lot here. In Romans 14, and I think in, um, I think it's in 2 Corinthians where it talks about those who regard a day um, and so on. No, here it is. That's in, that's in Romans chapter 14. Uh, let me just read the scriptures here, and you'll see that I, I am of the idea that any time we hear a sermon preached, we're sitting in with a group of people, we're listening to the Word of God, it is your responsibility to ask God how that sermon applies to you. And I've preached messages before where I've had people come up, boy, pastor, I know some people really needed to hear that one. <laughs> like, you know who I'm talking about. And I'm going, yeah, that would have been you. That, that, 
that would have been you. I don't say that because sometimes preachers can't say whatever they want to say, except behind the pulpit. But that was the person I was probably preaching to. And he said in Romans chapter 14, um, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Doubtful disputations. You know, maybe some of the things that we're doing is not really helping so much as it is hurting. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Uh, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Did you know that... um, Eating pork or not eating pork is not anywhere in the conditions of the new covenant. Did you know that by by you eating bacon, and I had for my lunch a bacon cheeseburger. Yes, I can has cheeseburger, and I has one. Did you know that it's nowhere in the terms of the new covenant that we cannot eat bacon or that we must eat bacon? That doesn't exist in the terms of the new covenant. But I have had people surround me. I was at a prophecy club meeting down in Dallas. And I got done. Boy, I was preaching my guts out. And I was teaching things and all this and that. And people come around me because I told them I had a Whataburger right before because I was starving to death. Had a Whataburger with bacon on it. And they come and surrounded me. How dare how we, you had that with bacon? Why don't you know that that's this, that, and the other? And I said, well, why did God offer Peter? Well, that God was tempting Peter. He was testing Peter. He didn't want, he, he was going to see the, no, 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 no. Bunch of liars is what they were. That's not in the terms of the new covenant. Don't try to mash somebody in there. Likewise, there's all kinds of stuff that people try to jam others into their version of what Christianity is supposed to look like and say, if you're not doing that or you're not looking like this or you're not responding this way or you don't have this or you don't say this or whatever, then you're obviously not, there's something wrong with your salvation. That's nowhere in the terms of the contract. That does not exist. But we judge. Let him that eateth not, let let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. And while we condemn one because they cannot stand in one way, do we not also condemn ourselves because we also cannot stand in a different way or in a different fashion or for a different reason? One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded In his own mind, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. By the way, I'm announcing right now, and I'm not going to shy away from it, and I'm not going to apologize, and I'm not going to take your guff over it either. I'm announcing right now, as we have done in the past, on or about December the 25th, I and my family are going to gather together. We're going to read the scriptures, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, And we are going to honor and celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and pray and thank him in anticipation of his coming again. And I'm not apologizing to anybody for that. Nor would I dare condemn you 
for not doing it with us. It's not your place and it's not my place. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, and, and I don't, I, you know what, and I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been a little sour this week. Just a little bit. Not bad. Just a little sour. And so some of that sourness might be coming out today. You say, man, what's, woo, what's wrong with Pastor? Whoa. Um, I don't understand what all this stuff is about. Well, he believes in lordship salvation. Oh, you don't believe in lordship salvation? I don't know what's wrong with you. Did you know that Christ is my Lord? Did you know that? Did you know that I pray and am a servant of my Lord Jesus Christ? I don't care what you say about my salvation. I am a servant of the Lord. And whether I live and how I live, that's up to my Lord. That's not up to anybody else. That's up to my Lord. My Lord governs the affairs of my life, and he does it very, very well. And when I get out of my Lord's will, he whoops on me and brings me back into it. That's what my Lord does. And see, that's the whole point of who art thou that judgest another man's servant? See, I don't I work for a a Lord who tells me what to do and who leads me into what to do. And so do you. So that's what you do. I am um, uh, many of you out there do not have a church to go to. You have opted to have me as your pastor. You are under the blanket of my authority. And protection, which means you're saying, Pastor, you're the pastor. I'm, I'm praying for you to give me the counsel of the Lord because that's what I need. I like that song we played. Preacher, tell me, tell me how it is. Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me like it is. And if you call me your pastor, that's what I'm going to do. That is exactly what I'm going to do. But there are some of you out there who go, who do have an outstanding, good King James Bible-believing church to go to. And I would say to you, I have no right to have any authority over your life. I don't. I have no right whatsoever. You are under a pastor. That pastor has authority over you. And if there's something that I say that your pastor is in disagreement with, or let's say there's a little doctrine thing, or he doesn't see it this way, or he doesn't see it that way. That man's your authority. That man God is using to protect you. Did you know that? God is using that pastor of that church to protect you. Submit to his authority as he is in submission to the words that are in this book. That's what you do. And I believe strongly in that. Now, if that man is not at submission to the Word of God, and you have responsibility over a wife and children, and you say, you know what, We're not gonna, I'm not going to take my, my kids, let them get... So a young person told me yesterday, so Pastor, in the old church we used to do, we used to go down for the children's church, and you know what we did? We played video games, and they did music the whole time. We all stood up and did one like this for 30 minutes and played video games, and then that was church. And then they had an altar call. And if that's the case, you got a right to pull out. But if you've got a good Bible-believing pastor, and he doesn't say, he's not preaching on UFOs and dragons and the New World Order, but God has led him in a different direction, and he's, he's your pastor, sit under him. That's, that's the right thing to do. Um, 
Verse 9, for to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. He's Lord. I don't know what, I don't know what the big deal is. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself, not to people in chat groups, not to, not to Google, not to the federal government, the NSA, not to one another. We give an account to our boss. It would be like, be like somebody who you work with. And I'm not saying somebody you work for. I'm saying somebody you work with. That they're pretty much they 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 they're pretty much on the same level as you. You're working on the assembly line, or you're working out in the field, or you're in one cubicle and they're in another in the same area. And them coming over saying, uh, "You need to be doing that." Uh, no, you're not doing it right. Um, uh, no, I listen. I need you to go over here and do this, and you're going. Who put you in charge? Well, I'm just telling you, I know this job, and I know, what, I know what it takes, and I know what you need to be doing, and I'm telling you, you know, I'm just trying to help you. No, you're not. And everybody can see that through that, and you're probably the most hated person in the whole office. Are you listening? That's what that's like. That's one Christian Telling another Christian, oh, you're not, you're not doing it right. I mean, I know what I'm talking about here. You know, you, I'm telling you, you're not doing it right. You know what? They don't work for you. They don't work. They don't owe you anything. One of the things that I'm trying to get across here is Christian love. Love for the brethren. How did Jesus say that the lost world would be able to identify us. Our love for one another. That's how our Lord, our boss, told us. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how they would know that we were his disciples. It's our love for one another. I'm not talking about cults. I'm not talking about those who've run off into apostasy, and I'm not talking about anything like that. I have been more sharply and unfairly criticized by King James Bible believers than I have anybody else, without a doubt. That floored me when it when it happened. I couldn't believe that. And I, I just asked the question, why? Why? Because I, I've got this idea. I try to live in a little la la land. I think I think all the pure Bible believers are to be on one side of the football, and all the Bible haters should be on the other side of the football. I think that we are opposing teams. There's no doubt in my mind about it. The people who believe every word is pure in the word of God and the people who don't, I think, I think we're on two different sides of the football. It's what I think. But I have been more sharply, meanly, unfairly criticized by King James Bible believers, more so than anybody else. This is not a Mike Hoggard pity party. I'm just telling you. I just kind of think that if we all stick with the same book and we have one faith and one baptism, I think we ought to try to get along with one another. I made the analogy to somebody, you know, uh, this football thing. Some, some players are on offense. Some players are on defense. 
Some are on special teams. And did you know that I've seen enough football in my life, whether it's offense, defense, or special teams, every one of us has dropped the ball at one time or another. We're supposed to be we're supposed to be together against the bad guys. That's what we're supposed to be. But we always turn that against ourselves. Any anybody will tell you that the secret to a winning team, the secret to a winning team is teamwork, getting along with one another. You all got a common we have a common goal here, trying to beat the devil. And trying to win and contend for the faith. But sometimes we don't do that. We go after the offense or the defense or the special teams or the coach. Shouldn't be that way. Uh, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. I like that. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. There's some people that don't eat bacon because it came from pigs and they see pigs and slop and wallowing around in their own manure and they're going, I'm not eating that. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Okay? There are people who eat health stuff. And that is not me, man. That is not me. But I can tell you, I cut out sugars. I th- the two biggest things that I've cut out of my life is sugars and French fries. And I've lost 30 pounds. Okay? So, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of sense here. But I'm not going to go after the vegans and people who eat health food and people who take this. and th- they, won't touch, they won't touch any pharmaceutical medication whatsoever. But they'll swallow it. They'll swallow all kinds of grass and roots and leaves and oils and everything. Under the, and I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I personally have not seen that work very well for me. But I am. I'm all for it if it if it works for you. But I'm not. I can't judge you for doing that. And I wouldn't say, hey, want a bacon sandwich? Huh? Want a bacon sandwich? It's got artificial sweetener on it. I wouldn't do that to you. Wouldn't do that to you. Uh, But if thy, uh, let's see here. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Mm -mm -mm. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Acceptable to God. Acceptable to God. And uh, can, can I just throw this in? We use, we use the word acceptable in a different way than God uses it. Have you ever noticed that? We look at something that's not quite perfect how we wanted it and say, well, it's acceptable, I guess. And what we have done is that we ourselves have lowered our standard to to accommodate somebody else's poor work, whether they were remodeling your house or painting your car or mowing your grass. I mean, you have an idea of what mowed grass looks like. You've seen it before. And the kid down the street wants 25 bucks, and you let him mow the grass, and he didn't do everything. You say, well, I don't want to fight with a neighbor. Here you go, Mr. Smith. I mowed your grass. Can I have 25? Well, it's acceptable, I guess. So you give him 25 bucks. You're not going to call him back, though. Did you know that that is not how God uses the word acceptable? Ask yourself this question, did God ever accept a spot or a blemish on any sacrifice? God didn't say, now there's a perfect sacrifice, 
And then there is an acceptable sacrifice. I mean, you look it over, there's a couple little blemishes on there, and I guess it'll be okay if I take it, but I really, you know, I'd rather have the nice, pretty one. That God never said that. That's not God. Uh, one of the things I've heard from people this is, well, God has three types of will, good and acceptable and imperfect, and, and those three are different types of will, and I don't believe that. I think God has one way, and that one way is good because there are not degrees of good. They're not. It's either good or bad. How many sins does it take to make one a, a sinner? The will of God is good. The will of God is acceptable. And when God says it's acceptable, that means it, it meets his highest standard of possible or God doesn't accept it. You King James Bible believers ought to know this because we've been telling everybody for years, if there's one mistake in our Bible, it's not the word of God. God would not, what? He would not accept a word that had defilement in it. He wouldn't accept a sacrifice that had defilement. So the word acceptable does not mean we just put up with it or God puts up with it. God has one will and it's good and acceptable and perfect three different ways of describing the one will of God. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, anyway, where did I, where was I? For, the, uh, for, for he that is, verse 18, he that is in these things, serveth Christ, is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For me, destroy not the work of God. And to be honest with you, if it was up to some people out there in the internet land, they would have shut, they would have happily shut Mike Hoggard down quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. I believe the Bible. I believe every word in the King James Bible. Well, that's not good enough for us. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Listen to this now. And you look at verse 22 of Romans 14. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Here's something that you need to remember about everybody else who says they believe this Bible. God gave them a gift, the same gift that he gave you. It's called a conscience. And God's Holy Spirit knows how to get a hold of somebody's conscience. He knows how to do it. Um, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And you listen to this now. Because there are people, they're going to write me an email. I already know this. They're going to write me an email because I said that on or about December 25th, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. They're going to call me all manner of sinner and pagan and you're not you're not right, and you're not a Bible believer, and you're this and that and the other. You're breaking God's law, and you're doing this and that and the other. They're going to very easily jump on me for what they perceive to be my sin. And yet the Bible says, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Do you remember what the terms of the contract are for us? God offering us a contract, the new covenant. What's the term? What is our part? For by grace, that's God's, that's God's um, offer and benefit. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the terms of the contract. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
And you want to know how you can rest at night without staying up late to see what else somebody is going to say on Facebook that you don't agree with? You know how to rest at night? Trust God. Because if he is Lord enough to tame your wild, sorry hide, he's Lord enough to tame and control anybody, including Mike Hoggard. God can do it. I think you ought to let him. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So just kind of think about that, because that's kind of that's kind of what I had in mind for today, and that's where we're going to go. Gather the gather the kids around. Gather the young people around. Gather grandma. Go get grandma. Hey, grandma. Turn as the world turns off. Come in here and sit down and watch Pastor Mike. He's going to teach you something about loving the world. Because we're not supposed to love the world. We're not supposed to love it. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy bacon. doesn't mean that. Okay? Well, bacon's in the world. It says, no, not the world. Did you ever notice that God made poison 90% of the time? God made poison taste bad. Things that were don't not things that were not supposed to eat, he made them taste and smell bad. Did you ever notice that? I mean, you you get some water like from some water source in the ground. First thing you ought to do is smell it. And if it smells like sewage, don't drink it cuz it probably is. But if you don't get if you don't get an odor you and taste it a little bit and taste the minerals in there, you're going, eh, that's pretty good. Strawberries. <gasps> strawberries. Did you know strawberries taste good? Bananas, apples, peaches, pears. You know they taste good. Do you know broccoli even tastes good? I love broccoli. Okay. Spinach. Man, I love spinach. Deer meat, deer sausage. <laughs> it tastes good. Okay. And stuff that tastes bad. Like, you know, dog doo-doo, Jezebel, okay? We, we, don't eat, we don't eat that, okay? Acorns. I mean, we eat peanuts, right? We don't eat acorns. You ever wonder why? They don't taste good, okay? Probably not good for us. So we don't eat acorns, okay? So anyway, it's okay to enjoy the things that benefit our body and, you know, things we have to do. But he's talking about the things of the world and the lusts of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He said, love not those things. If you're going to call yourself saved, born again, there are things you got to learn how to start not liking and start hating a little bit, especially when you see the consequences they bring. He says in James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Pretty, pretty plain language there. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to what? This world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, your mind needs remo- renewed because it's all messed up because of the world. You think the world's way. You do things the world's way. You have your marriage according to the world. Well, I, everybody on Facebook's getting a divorce. Why can't I get a divorce? Everybody on Facebook's running around. They're cheating. Why can't I do it? Why can't I be rebellious to my husband or my mom and dad? How come I can't? How come I can't listen to Katy Perry? Everybody else does. How come I can't wear my pants down to my knees? 
Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that. There it is. Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because if it's not good and it's not perfect and it's not acceptable, it's not the will of God. Just isn't. All right? Uh, how about this one? 1 Corinthians 2.12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. I've got to see when you get saved, you're supposed to have a different spirit in you. You're supposed to look at rock concerts and go, ah, boy, you know what? I just, I don't think I can go to that stuff anymore. It just doesn't appeal to me the way it used to. That's what you're supposed to be like. You got a different spirit in you. Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to stop right here. Stop right here. Did you ever notice that vultures love to eat roadkill and doves don't? You never see a dove hanging around the side of the road eating on an old, dead, maggot-infested skunk, do you? You never see a dove do that. You see vultures do it. They eat that old rotten meat all day long. Eat them, eat the maggots with it. They don't care. You see, when you get a different spirit in you, you get a different appetite. You just don't love the things of the world anymore. Doesn't bring you the pleasure that it used to. See, it's a pretty good analogy there, okay? Anyway, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Ephesians 2, 2, wherein in time past she walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The, see, the course of the world is governed by the devil himself. That's why he said don't love it. Ephesians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Mm. See, don't be don't supposed, supposed to be part of the world. Colossians 2 8, where beware list, watch this now. Here is one of those cautionary verses. I talked about this last night. I preached on it last night, preached on it last Wednesday night. There are cautionary verses in the Bible that teach us to walk circumspect to teach us to be careful about who we are and where we go and how, how lofty we think we are. Let him that standeth take heed. Why? Lest he fall. And so there are some who act like they can do no wrong, and they act like they never do, and they never have. And I don't have to worry about anything. I don't think that's right. I, I believe in cautionary Christianity because there are caution verses in the Scriptures, plainly, plainly there. Um, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Joel Osteen! <laughs> after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see how that works there? So Joel says you can be healthy, uh, have a perfect body, have a Barbie doll wife, and have lots of money and, and lots of stuff, and that's what, that's what Christianity is. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I'm just going to keep it to myself. I love you, okay? But beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. I will say it this way. 
Okay? My body, um, as of the moment that I just really turned everything over to the Lord, my body doesn't really belong to me anymore. I, I Number one, I disowned it a long time ago, disinherited it. Okay? I'm mad at my body. I don't want anything to do with it anymore. Okay? I can every time we start the Pastor Mike online, I put my head down. You know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing this little patch up here that you can see my head coming through there. Now, now either I'm growing taller and I'm growing right out of the top of my hair, or some of it's falling out, and I ain't real happy about that. No, I'm not gonna go wear a wig. But my body doesn't belong to me. It really doesn't. Now, you say, now, hold on, Pastor Mike. I mean, you got diabetes, right? You know, and you did that and blah, blah. Well, yeah, okay, I, I, I get that, okay? But you can't, and, and most of you have not done this, so please don't get me wrong. I appreciate every bit of advice that I get. But I've had some that have been, that have ridden me hard. Because, well, you just don't take care of yourself and your body's a temple and you ought to be eating this and, and chewing this and that, you know, that, that grew from the ground. You ought to do this. And I mean, maybe you're well-meaning. But let me tell you something that I know for a fact about Mike Hoggard. I'm going to live every second that God has on his schedule. And I'm not going to outlive that schedule nor am I going to fail to reach that schedule. My body is going to last exactly how long God wants it to last. My ministry and my work and my labor is going to last that long too. You know what that, you know what that does for me? That lets me go to sleep at night. Because I worry sometimes, am I doing enough? Am I reaching enough people? Am I helping people like I, like I ask God to let me do? Am I, and, and Lord, what, what, happens if I, what happens if I die? What happens if I can't do this anymore? And God says, Mike, I was running the universe and saving souls way before you showed up. Oh, that's right. Okay, I got it. So anyway, I just... I mean, I love my family, I love my wife, and I love what I'm doing. I like to hang around as long as I can, but God's in charge of my body, okay? God is. He's in charge of my body. And I want to introduce to you a fellow by the name of Demas. Watch what Paul says about Demas. This, this floored me. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, Philemon 124. Did you see that? Demas was considered amongst Marcus and Aristarchus and Lucas. Demas was considered one of the fellow laborers of the Apostle Paul. A guy that stood arm in arm, fought the good fight with Paul, said, Paul, we're here for you, buddy. Whatever you want us to do, we'll do. Paul said, you know what? You need this done over here. Absolutely, Apostle Paul, we'll do it. I've seen people like that in church. I have. I've been, in, I've been around this thing, and I've seen them come in. And, oh, we want to do something for God. We want to do something for Bethel Church. We want to do this. We want to do that. Okay? That's how he started. That's not how he ended up. 2 Timothy 4.10, this is the last letter that Paul wrote before they cut his head off. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Did you see that? Demas at one time was his fellow laborer. What happened to Demas? He loved the present world. He loved his hide. He loved his pleasures. He loved his lusts. And he forsook me. And as you look at the language now, the scriptures, go back and look at this now. What did he do? 
He loved this present world. That is exactly what God said, don't do, love not the world. It's exactly what he said, don't do. Don't be a Demas. Second Peter 2, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter and is worse with them than the beginning. That's what happened to Demas. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. They started out good. They didn't end up so good. They left. They broke the contract. You know why? They loved the world when they should have loved God. They went after the earthly prize like Esau and failed of the heavenly prize like Jacob. They're not going to heaven. Now, you can say, oh, you believe you lose your salvation. It did, never said in those verses that, any, that they were saved. I'm of the firm opinion, biblically, that it's not salvation if it didn't save you. You can't call it salvation if it doesn't actually save you. It's like, it's like, um, it's like you get off a plane. And you go to the you go to the you go to the counter, um, the the where you rented the car. And you say, "All right, I got a reservation under the name of Mike Hoggard." Oh, here, okay, we looked it up. Here's your res. Okay, we got your reservation right here. Um, I'm sorry, Mister Hoggard, we don't have your car. <laughs> yeah, you do. No, I'm sorry, Mister Hoggard, we don't we don't have your car. But. I made a reservation. I know, we, we have the reservation right here. We, we just don't have the car. Well, then that's not a reservation, is it? If it's a reservation. See, the word reserve is here. I say, I need the car. You say, we're going to take the car that you want. We're going to put it away over here in the back lot so nobody can take it because we are reserving it for you. There's a word, that word's in the King James Bible. Do you know it? Reserved for you. God, salvation is a reservation. And it's not, it's not a reservation if they didn't reserve the car. It's not salvation if it didn't save the soul. It's something else, but it's not salvation. Check it out. Go read it for yourself. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is essential, people. If you don't have faith, you love the world. And if you love the world, you're not going to heaven. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that what? Believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. John 4, verse 5, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I, I can do this. Watch this. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make some people mad. They're not going to like it. I'm going to do it. Spirit of truth. Spirit of error. Okay? Niv. Foul spirit, name thyself. Niv. Okay? Spirit of error. Right there. And they won't listen to us, will they? They, they won't listen to us. Hey, you know, once you just look at, just check it out for yourself. That's why I did the Which Bible You Be the Judge series. Give them the evidence. Here, you figure it out. You just make the decision for yourself. I'm going to lay out the evidence. Take a look at it. Ask yourself the question, why is Jesus falling out of heaven in Isaiah 14? Why is that? They don't hear it. They don't want to know it. So they are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to put up on the screen, and, and, and this is going to be so easy. It's going to be so easy. 
Okay? And I want you to all to participate. Even though I can't hear you, I'm going to pretend that I can hear you. Okay? And I want you to say it out loud. All right? Um, it's, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. Either it's going to be worldliness or godliness. You're going to say, well, that's worldly or that's godly. And when you see them, it's going to be so obvious. All right? So here we go. Here's the first picture now. And you just say it out loud. Worldly or godly? Here's the first one. Worldly. That's worldly. That's of the world. The prince of the power of the air. That's worldly. All right, here's the second one. Godly. That's godly. And I want you to... I want, to, I want to see if you can do this. Can you not even feel a different emotional feeling and response to this picture as opposed to this one? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Let me do that again. Watch this. Take a look at that. You feel differently, don't you? You're, that's because your spirit is telling you that's of God. That's right. See how uh, see how easy this stuff is? Okay, here's uh, here's another one. All right, ready? Worldly or godly? Worldly. All right, here's another one. Ready? Worldly. That is one of Rick Warren's youth venues at Saddleback Community Church. That's worldly. All right, ready for this one? Worldly or godly? Godly. Let me do this again now, okay? Let's go back to this picture and then feel, feel the emotion. Feel how your spirit responds. Isn't that amazing? All right, here's one. Worldly or godly? Get ready. Worldly or godly? Did you feel it? Let's do it again. Ready? Your heart, if you're right with God, responds to this image because you know it's right. All right, here's another one. Ready? Worldly or godly? Worldly. Look at this one. Godly. That's godly. All right, here we go. Ready? Worldly or godly? Worldly. Look at this one. Worldly or godly? Didn't you feel that? And see that, that picture there on the right? I don't, I don't know who that is. Maybe that's one of the Wesley brothers or something like that. Standing out there preaching the Word of God in public and people giving attendance to the Word of God. There's a church in Kenya. I've been in churches like that. They are amazing places. And the Word of God gets preached, and those people sit in those huts, and they don't care. And they're hearing the Word of God. All right, here's another one. Worldly or godly? All right, here's this one. Worldly or godly? Worldly. Worldly or godly? Here's another one. Worldly or godly? Worldly. How about this one? Those are tracks, by the way, chick tracks. Guys passing out tracks, talking to people. Worldly or godly? It's godly. And you know the difference. See, you could be spending your time here or here. You could be doing this. And that's what you used to do. Now you can do this. 
and I'm not just talking about going out on the street. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I am not a street preacher. I am not. Believe it or not, I have, I don't know if it's a phobia or what, I can't do it. I mean, I literally can't do it. I sweat. I get sick to my stomach. I, I am, you wouldn't believe how shy I am around people I don't know. It's, it's a thing of mine. It really is. Knocking doors. I used to could do it when I was a teenager, when I was cocky. I can't do it anymore. I mean, I visit people, but, and if the opportunity presents itself, I love to bring up the gospel. If, if I, I can, if someone gives me the bait, I'll take it. But other than that, I, I am just, I'm poor. I, I can't do it. You can either use your Facebook page for this garbage or this. You can, some of you, some of you, use it for that. You're tattlers. Why don't you just use it for that? All right, here's another picture. Look at this one, okay? Worldly or godly? Look at those girls. Now get ready, get ready for the slide, okay? Get ready for this one. Worldly or godly? I'm going to show you this. That's godly. Let me, let me go back to this. Look at that. Now look at that. See what that does to your heart? You can recognize that a mile away. So don't give me that nonsense. Well, God doesn't really care what we look like on the outside. But you do. And everybody else around you does too, and you know it. That's why you dress the way you do. Worldly or godly? First time I looked at this picture, I'm going, why is that guy blowing beer out through that funnel? Because I, I never did this. I'm not saying I was perfect. I just never got invited to this party. Worldly or godly? That's worldly. Here's another one. Worldly or godly? You say, what in the world is that? Them that riot in the daytime? Here we go. Worldly or godly? Worldly or godly? Worldly. How about this one? Let me, let me go back to this one. Did you notice here? This is stuff. The th this is the things of this world, isn't it? The things of this world. That's what that is. Look what this guy's got. I got this picture hanging up in my office. Guy's got a Bible and a little bowl of soup and a little bit of bread. God, thank you for giving me my daily bread. That is so godly. Look at this one. Worldly or godly? Wanting the recognition and the achievements of man. It's worldly. That's godly. Now, here's the last one. Okay? Take a look at it. Worldly or godly? And with this one, I will say, it depends. Depends on what? You see, I go fishing every now and then. I don't like to fish much, but I go fishing every now and then. This coming November, I will be deer hunting. Okay? I'm not much of a water skier, but I love to run the boat. And I love the fact that the Cardinals are going to the National League Championships. I love that. But if I had tickets to the NLCS, the Cardinals versus, who are they playing? The Dodgers. And those tickets were a Sunday or a Wednesday night. I'm not going. 
because God comes first and everything else after that. And there are people, there are churches are full of people who they kind of tell you their heart. They do this and justify it when actually they should be here. Different spirit, isn't it? Uh, let's read a few emails. See, see if I made anybody mad. Pam says, what is the significance of the two different accounts of Judas' death in Matthew and Acts? Pam, I asked you to send me uh, the references on that. Let's see here. Uh, I'll look for them in a little bit. All right, Pam, thank you for sending that. Uh, let's see here. That is for an article. Can't do that. Karen says, Dear Pastor Mike, you always say you don't know who this sermon is for. Well, I know one person who is guilty as charged, and that is me. That's what she wrote. Thanks for your teachings on the KJV and all my 53 years. I've heard nothing quite like it in the ways of understanding. Thanks for making it simple for the simple-minded, such as myself. God bless you and yours, and may he always keep you safe under the shadow of his will. You know what, Karen? That is the best prayer anybody can pray for me. Okay? Safety. I appreciate that. Karen, I, I'm humbled by what you said. And just, Karen, be sure. Don't get me in trouble. Be sure you tell God thank you. All right? Uh, Joseph says, great song. Uh, that was Greater Vision. That's uh, the, the new album they come out with. I, I like Greater Vision. I've liked their music for a while. I think, they're, I think they're pretty good guys. I don't know that for sure. Don't know. But I've listened to their music over time, and I like, I like the things they sing about. So anyway, Joseph, appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Kate says, Pastor Mike, thanks for being a man sold out to the Lord. As for Chuck, up Chuck Missler. I followed him for years. That was until he rambled on a show with Tim LaHaye and others, all of whom received these horrible gold medals. It was weird. Really? Gold medals? Wow. Um, let's see here. Okay, all right, back to Pam. Acts 1, 18. Everybody get your King James out. Somebody said the Bible's messed up. I don't think so. Acts chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, this is concerning Judas, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue Akeldama, that is to say the field of blood. I think I already know where this is going. Matthew 27, 3. Yeah, there's a mistake in them there Bibles. That's why none of the Bibles are right. That's why I listen to so-and-so because he tells it like it is. Matthew 27, verse 3 says, Then Judas which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Of course he did. He went and hanged himself. See, the Bible is giving you the whole story. It's telling you in Matthew that he went and he hung himself. See, because and see, and God had that set up because cursed is anyone that hangeth on a tree. So he goes out and hangs himself. And he's out there and he's dead. Swaying in the breeze, stinking up the field. And the rope breaks. And he falls headlong. And you see, if you've probably never seen a body, a human body, that has been dead for a couple days without being embalmed. And I'm telling you, after about three or four days, it just starts coming apart. 
the skin turns black, and I helped my brother-in-law pick up a guy that had been dead in his trailer four days. No one there. No one, no family, nothing. The neighbors in the trailer court were going, I think we need to call the police. <laughs> that's what they did. That's how, any, that's how people noticed what was going on. And my, my brother-in-law went in there, picked up the, uh, he, he said, Mike, I'll do the hard part. We were, I mean, we were in body suits and everything. And he goes in there, no mask or nothing. I mean, he's used to this. Grabs this guy, puts him in the body bag, and he says, okay, now help me get the bag on the stretcher. And I did. And I'm just going, like that. And he said, Phew. well, I'm glad he had clothes on. And I'm going, yeah, that'd be like really weird, wouldn't it? He's no, 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 no. He said, when they're laying around this long, they tend to come apart. You grab their leg, and then you've got a handful of leg going, what do I do? I mean, that's just how it is. So here is Judas. Swinging in the breeze. Been there nobody knows how long. And then he just comes apart. And his body comes off of that where he's hanging. Bowels gushed everywhere. That's the death of the wicked, people. That's worldly. No, 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 uh, no contradiction in the scripture. It's the same story. That's what it is. Uh, let's see here. Edwin from Jakarta, how you doing? It's been a while to ask you a question. Well, here's one regarding Ezekiel 1820. Let me get there. Let me get there. Ezekiel 1820. How this relates to our inherited sin from Adam and salvation through Jesus Christ. Could you please shed some light on this verse? Yeah, hang on here. Let me. How's that? Does that, does that work good for you, Ed? Is that enough light? Um, could you please shed some light on this verse? Still watching weekly, watchman video broadcast sermons, gain so much insight from it. Let me read Ezekiel 18.20. Actually, I'm going to do it like this. I'm reading between the lines. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yeah. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Let's see here. Is this, is this how this relates to our inherited sin from Adam and salvation through Jesus Christ? Yeah, abs oh yeah, absolutely. He knows that he mentioned, didn't mention the body that sins. He said the soul that sinneth. The sin of the soul is by hanging on to the body, okay, and rejecting the offer of the covenant. Okay, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the soul does not, even though, you know what? See, I know my dad. I love him. Man, I miss him. Two years. Man, I miss him. But I know him. He was a sinner. And you know what Mike Hogger did? I inherited some of his sinful nature in me. I did. Okay? And I don't like it. But my soul is not responsible for that. My soul is not responsible for what my dad did in the flesh. Mm -mm. So it, it's a great verse, and I, and I think you're right on that. Um, the soul that sinneth shall die. Now, the flesh inherits the sin automatically. That's why the flesh cannot be redeemed. But the soul can be redeemed from the flesh. But if the soul sins... If the soul rejects the offer of the contract, it goes to hell. That's, that's my best guess, by the way. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Mark says, seems like no one wants to take responsibility for their own trouble. Give us your oil. Appreciate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chris, what's your opinion on communion? Is it biblical or Catholic heresy? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. The Lord's Supper? is biblical we were told to do that along with washing of the saints feet <laughs> oh yeah we were told to do that one too you don't believe that go read the scriptures it's right there next to the lord's supper and uh yeah we were told to do that we were told to show the lord's death until he returns now the, the there is a corrupted evil version of that in the occult satanists do it pagans do it so do catholics they eat god 
Okay? But, in, yeah, communion and the Lord's Supper is right. Larry says, 40 years ago this month I was saved. I remember I was using KJB when I became a believer, and then I bought another translation. I was having a hard time understanding that translation, so I prayed about it, and the Lord said to me clearly in my heart that it was not his word. You know, I believe that. So that from, from that day forward, I became a KJV Bible believer. This was even before I knew there was a controversy over versions. I'm so thankful for the Lord keeping me from being deceived. Amen to that. He said, P.S., the Lord, the Pure Bible Search software has blessed me in his word so much. This tool has helped me draw closer to the Lord. Everybody needs this. Yes, and I appreciate that, um, uh, that unpaid-for advertisement. And if you'll download our software at, for uh, $49.95, that's $4,995, uh, then we'll get it to you. No, it's free. Larry, I appreciate that. Matt says, God bless Pastor Mike Hogger and all the congregation of Bethel Church. Matt, we love you. Praying for you. Andrew says, I was wondering when Satan was going to come right out with the idea that some people are more highly evolved than others. That day came yesterday with the premiere of the Tomorrow People. I've not heard of that. They supposedly more highly evolved people are called homo superiors. My wife had a homo superior once. She worked in an office with a lesbian boss. People are going to become supposedly superior by accepting the mark of the beast. I've not heard of that. I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to get on that. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Shane wants me to talk about Marzuli and how they're telling people about giants and the book of Enoch. And Shane, yes. Okay. Now I'm doing, I, I haven't picked it up in a while, but I got a sneaky suspicion. Now, in fact, I'll just share it with you guys about the book of Enoch. Okay. They're touting this book of Enoch, like, because they say it's, oh, it's got messianic prophecies in it. I got a suspicion. My suspicion is that the book of Enoch has prophecies about a different Messiah. That's my sneaky suspicion. And so if you want to help do some research on that, send it to me. You're the man. All right. Oh. Ah. Mark says, I'm starting to hear my pastor say things like, if you're KJV only, you might be a legalist. I don't know how to deal with this because I'm afraid that we'll have to leave these people we love. You know what? I, I think I would go to your pastor in private and say, you know what, pastor? I pay tithes here. I support this church and I pray for you every day. And I didn't appreciate you calling me that name because I love my book and it's precious. And you just painted me with a brush that is unfair. Do it in love. Go to him in fear and trembling. That's your pastor, Mark. That's your authority. But you can go to him privately, and you should. And say, Pastor, don't condemn me again. See what happens, okay? Well, maybe next week I'll be in a better mood. I probably will. Just been I've been dealing with some tough things this week, okay? So you just keep me in your prayers and I'll keep you in mine and just hope, you know, no harm, no foul today. Just just giving you the word of God. Maybe it wouldn't hurt us to listen to it. All right? This is your pastor. We'll see you later. <laughs>